Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming to, the, to this event. I'm David Nather. I'm the healthcare editor at Politico Pro, and thanks for joining us to the latest event in the Brookings Institution series on Campaign 2012. Um, this is a series of panel discussions um, that explore 12 of the most important issues that the next president is going to face. Um, our topic today will be healthcare and how should the next president address the, uh, the challenges of the Affordable Care Act and uh, the budgetary, budgetary challenges of the healthcare entitlement programs as well. Um, join us today are Alice Rivlin, uh, who is the Office of Management and Budget Director under President Bill Clinton, uh, also the co-author of the Domenici Rivlin uh, uh, Deficit Reduction Plan uh, produced by the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, also joining us today is Ross Hammond, uh, whose specialty is modeling social dynamics uh, with, a, with a big focus on public health work. He's going to talk about the challenges uh, uh, the next president will face in finding ways to prevent obesity, which will be one of the biggest um, healthcare spending challenges to come. Um, also today, uh, we're very lucky to be joined by Tom Mann, uh, who's who has a wealth of expertise on, on Congress and uh, has well been, been well known for years in his work on, on the subject. Um, he has is, is just co-authored a, a new book with Norm Ornstein about the, the problems facing Congress right now with the extreme polarization that we're seeing. And uh, finally, we're joined by Mark McClellan, the, the director of the Engelberg Center, um, who is, uh, whose specialty is finding ways to make healthcare uh, uh, cheaper and still better. And uh, uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, a, a very generous uh, gift that the Engelberg Center has just received to help its mission in a great way. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? David, thanks for being here and thanks for the opportunity. And today is a big day for us at the Engelberg Center, the Irene Diamond Fund for uh, uh, so set up by Irene Diamond has uh, made a, a major contribution to the Engelberg Center, setting up both the Irene Diamond Fund for Healthcare Innovation and the Irene Diamond Fellowship for Public Health Leadership. This is a five-year, $10 million gift to help support our efforts on reforming healthcare policies to improve care and lower costs, as you said. A big thrust of this initiative is going to be around public health, the uh, kinds of issues that, uh, that, that Ross and others have, ha have worked on, um, uh, changing behavior and bringing that part of uh, the big determinants of health more into the healthcare reform efforts. It'll include uh, uh, a lot of work with public health experts as well as traditional uh, healthcare groups on uh, hopefully on uh, both sides of the aisle, and hopefully for more of the kinds of uh, bipartisan efforts that Tom keeps reminding us are, are very much needed these days. Mm. It's wonderful, and congratulations too. Thank you. It's quite an accomplishment. Um, I'd like to start today by um, by discussing the three issue briefs that are being released today, um, that uh, that that focus on the healthcare topics ahead. Um, I'd like to start with Alice Rivlin's paper, uh, which which explores the uh, uh, the, the path ahead um, on the Affordable Care Act and uh, why the next president should look for. Uh, for ways to, to build on the Affordable Care Act and, and improve it, um, but not repeal it. Right. Um, well, the signature achievement of uh, the Obama administration in the health care area clearly is the Affordable Care Act. It was hard fought. It was not an attractive battle. It uh, is uh, one of the symptoms of the thing that uh, Tom Mann has uh, focused on, that. Uh, our politics are very polarized, but uh, it did pass, and it is, uh, I believe, a very positive uh, next step in the battle to get coverage for all Americans, uh, especially uh, those who do not have uh, insurance, <coughs> and those tend to be uh, low-income Americans, though not covered by, uh, by Medicaid. Uh, and some people who just don't want to buy insurance uh, but do end up 
needing health care and uh, end up costing the rest of the system uh, when they end up in the emergency room or uh, whatever, uh, guess what, you're not invulnerable. Uh, many of them are young and not poor. They just don't want to participate uh, in, uh, in the insurance pool. But I think Americans believe in insurance. Uh, we, uh, uh, and uh, most of us feel that uh, health care uh, is something that uh, you should be able to afford uh, when you need it. And the Affordable Care Act uh, extended uh, insurance uh, to uh, quite a large number of the uninsured, establishing uh, exchanges, uh, much like the uh, uh, system in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts under Romney's governorship, uh, in which uh, uh, people who didn't have insurance uh, could go to a well-structured uh, exchange uh, online uh, and choose among plans that they had some, uh, some uh, information about, hopefully better and better information as the system uh, progresses. Now, uh, people who don't have much money, health insurance is expensive, uh, have to have a subsidy to do that, and that is uh, one of the main things the Affordable Care Act does. It establishes under state leadership uh, the exchanges and then uh, defines subsidies for uh, people who need uh, health insurance. And then it also improves the uh, health insurance uh, market says that uh, insurers uh, can't refuse uh, to insure people because they have some kind of uh, uh, prior condition or can't charge them more if they're sick than if they're healthy uh, and other uh, uh, values in the insurance market. But that is going to cost uh, insurance companies more money. Uh, and uh, so they're willing to go along with that uh, if these other people who don't choose to buy insurance get into the pool. Uh, so the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act uh, therefore had a mandate uh, to, uh, to buy uh, insurance, which the Supreme Court is now uh, looking at. Person <coughs> excuse me, personally, I don't think uh, if the mandate goes down, uh, it will be too significant. That can be, the, the uh, law can be changed uh, to essentially bribe people to buy insurance instead of forcing them to buy insurance. Uh, and uh, get more people uh, into the pool. Uh, but um, perhaps uh, mostly because of the polarization of our politics, uh, no Republicans voted uh, for the Affordable Care Act, and uh, all of the Republican candidates have said they would repeal it. Now, what would happen if they did repeal it? It's not very clear, uh, because the insurance reforms have already gone into place. The exchanges are getting up uh, and running. Uh, and uh, so my hope is that the next president, whoever it is, uh, continues to implement, perhaps accelerates the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and uh, keeps it uh, in the mix. I wanted to ask you about one of the one of the the improvements that you suggest or additions that you suggest. It's sensible tort reform. Now that can mean so many different things to so many different people, and you know the two parties have never seen anywhere close to eye to eye on that. It seems, but I'd like to get your thoughts on what would what would be a, a, a sensible sort of middle ground on tort, tort reform. What would be sensible policies that would make the law better? Well, first, tort reform has been uh, a very contentious issue, as, as, uh, as you uh, note. Uh, and it's also been exaggerated. The uh, proponents of tort reform say uh, it would make a huge difference in lowering the cost of medical care. There is very little evidence of that. Malpractice insurance is quite expensive for a subset of specialties. I'm looking uh, down the line at Mark to see if he uh, is, because <laughs> uh, he's more of an expert on this than I am. Uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, it doesn't drive health care costs. Uh, however, uh, uh, especially if you took the uh, uh, route of saying a doctor that is following accepted practice guidelines 
uh, and there will be more and more of those as time goes on, uh, has a safe harbor. He doesn't, he can use that as a defense. Uh, he, he did the thing that was the prescribed thing to do under these uh, circumstances. Uh, that's, that's one way to go. Uh, caps on damages are another, uh, though I think they're probably not the best way to go. Okay. And lastly, before we, we, before we bring the other panelists in, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about the budgetary challenges, right. because that will be the other big piece that the next president uh, comes to. What, uh, what's the most sensible path, in your view, for, for the next person in the White House, whoever it is? I think we know what to do about our looming uh, budget uh, uh, deficit uh, or debt. The debt is on track to grow faster than our economy can grow. That is partly because of the growth of the, of the entitlement programs, especially Medicare and Medicaid, because of the big bulge of retirees, the uh, uh, retirement of the baby boom generation, uh, and the fact that health care uh, despite uh, all efforts to bend the curve, uh, is uh, more expensive every year, and you multiply that uh, by the number of beneficiaries, uh, and you get federal spending rising faster than the economy can grow, and revenues don't. Uh, I've served on two commissions now. You mentioned Domenici Rivlin, but I also served on Simpson Bowles. They came to roughly the same conclusion because the arithmetic drives you there. Uh, it's not a partisan thing. Uh, we can't solve this problem uh, unless we do two things. Uh, one is reduce the rate of growth of health care spending, and there are different ways of doing that, but it's uh, got to be part of the mix. And the other is raise more revenues, uh, because we can't absorb this many older people and their health care uh, without uh, more revenues, unless we're basically willing to close down the rest of the government. And there are things we need the government to do. Uh, so uh, taking the either the Simpson Bowles or the Domenici Rivlin or the Gang of Six, or uh, all of these proposals, which are all roughly the same, and uh, putting together a bipartisan deal seems to me essential. Uh, the president knows that. He tried to do that in the negotiation with Speaker Boehner. Uh, it is, again, very difficult because the extremes in both parties are uh, not very enthusiastic about uh, uh, tax increases on the Republican side or uh, changes in Medicare and Medicaid on the Democratic side. Uh, and, uh, but he's got to do that. I think everybody knows that. Uh, and uh, after the election, perhaps beginning in the uh, lame duck session, uh, I hope we will see a deal. Uh, it's got to be a bipartisan deal, and uh, it's got to include uh, entitlements and more revenue. Okay, that sounds like a good note to bring in uh, Tom and uh, the paper that he's putting out today, which focuses on the polarization that we're, that we're seeing. I think Tom's point in all of this has been, you know, where is the where's the where's the bipartisanship that you can kind of hook onto? What you know, where's the uh, uh, where is the middle that you could that you could look to for for a deal like this? But Tom, I'd like to get your thoughts on what's doable and what's not. Well, thank you. Uh, I have written just a brief response uh, paper to to Alice's uh, paper, which uh, which is a uh, in part a a description and support endorsement of the. Affordable Care Act and a and a recommendation to uh, to strengthen it, uh, especially its its uh, cost cutting uh, measures. Uh, but secondly, the uh, the second part is really uh, to understand the uh, the important dimensions of healthcare cost increases in the broader deficit and debt problem that confront the country. And the centerpiece of, uh, of, of Alice's discussion of the latter, as far as this paper is concerned, is, is uh, uh, in part taken from the, the uh, uh, Rivlin Domenici budget recommendations, but also makes reference to 
uh, to Paul Ryan and Ron Wyden's new initiative. It's really built around uh, the idea of a premium uh, support for Medicare. Um, and Alice is, is sort of very careful in, in, uh, in talking about the conditions uh, under which such a, such a restructuring of Medicare, uh, including the continuing option, you might call it a public option, uh, for Medicare through traditional fee, uh, uh, fee for service. And, and she recognizes fully the many uh, elements of regulation that would be required to uh, to achieve such an effort, um, uh, and I'm sort of with her. I've I've been a compatriot uh, and an admirer of Alice's for for many years, and I see where she's coming from. Um, uh, and as and it really is part of her broader effort over these years to grapple with with the the broader deficit and debt problems, and I and I applaud her for that. Um, Alice says in the paper, there is no alternative to bipartisan consensus. And my argument uh, here is bipartisan consensus is not an alternative. Uh, it's a pipe dream, given the, given the current realities of, uh, of, of American politics. And, and that the, the real danger is that Alice's support for a premium uh, support system uh, is adopted without her embrace of uh, a retention and strengthening of the Affordable Care Act without her admonition that taxes have to increase uh, despite her broader concern for, uh, for social justice and and uh, the special health care problems of, uh, of the disabled uh, and of, uh, of people with, with very low incomes. Uh, because when, uh, when you try to, to reach such an agreement with the contemporary Republican Party, there, there is no bargaining uh, on the other side. And, I mean, one illustration of the limits of bipartisan efforts to solve a whole range of problems really comes with health reform. Uh, remember the bipartisan um, policy center's program for this. Baker, Dole, um, and Daschle, with George Mitchell off doing some diplomacy, enormous efforts with bipartisan staff to bring in the experts. Mark, my, my colleague here, put together a task force that included conservatives and, you know, we've got all these f former officials and scholars and think ta tankers and boy, they reached agreement. You know what? It was pretty damn close to what the Affordable Care Act was and, you know, as Alice said, it got zero, zero Republican uh, votes uh, um, uh, in, in the Congress. In fact, many elements of, uh, uh, of the bill, which had been adopted from Republican alternatives or Republican plans in states such as Massachusetts, then was characterized as uh, socialistic medicine. I mean, right there, it, it tells you this. If, if you begin with the presumption you can't get anything done, uh, without forging agreement between two parties, one of which is, is center-left and pretty pragmatic, and the other of which is now extremely ideological and strategic in its hyper-partisanship, which is built around the, the broader plans uh, of architect and salesman uh, Paul Ryan, who who is one uh, impressive and formidable um, uh, salesman for his plan. But if you look at it, it, the broader plan includes a dramatic reduction in taxes and tax rates. Uh, I mean, there is, there is a promise not to pay for extension of expiring tax cuts, but 
pay for the further reductions through, quote, tax reform. But that becomes, that becomes a cover. We're all going to do that. We're going to lower rates and get rid of all of those uh, uh, destructive uh, uh, deductions and credits that, uh, that stand in the way of economic uh, efficiency. But alas, the biggest producing ones would, would be to make capital gains taxes about the same as ordinary income, and that is off the table as, uh, as many such other items are. It involves so dramatic cuts in taxes, um, increases in defense spending, the effort to contain Medicare budget, but not immediately, uh, because politically that's radioactive. It's, it's to phase it in with people who are now under 55 years of age, setting up a system of, uh, call them whatever you want, vouchers or premium support, but it, it, it really is an effort um, uh, to begin to put a cap on the spending not as the ACA does with, with an overall budget uh, that then gets uh, policed by an independent commission uh, forcing Congress, hopefully, to, to act in, in ways uh, uh, to do it, but rather we presume over time either the benefits of competition uh, among insurers will lower the cost and that will take care of it, if not, it's inevitable that uh, those, though the real value of uh, of those relative to healthcare costs will will decline over time. And finally, and the most important, which we see unfolding now, is a series of block grants, um, uh, especially for Medicaid, whose I think largest cost or one of its largest costs is long term uh, uh, long term care. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's really quite, uh, quite extraordinary what is being proposed. And now, in, after the threat of a government shutdown and, and a, uh, a default on, uh, uh, on, on the, the, with the debt ceiling, we, uh, agreement was reached. And now that, although signed in law, is being renegotiated, reset. And Ryan's budget committee right now is working on um, on changing that and instituting much deeper cuts in, in means-tested uh, programs and, and uh, fewer, if any, reductions in, uh, in defense spending, the sequestration part of it. Deeper cuts overall than called for in spending and a, a shift in a, a really dramatic way. It's possible that over time, uh, a premium support system would work for Medicare, but I sure wouldn't want to try it until we had seen how we did with the exchanges and ACA, how we do with much easier risk adjustment uh, to keep insurers from cherry picking and to see if individual consumers have enough uh, uh, discretion to choose plans that would actually lead to economies and the production of services when, when in fact those costs are highly concentrated among a minority of, of beneficiaries. So it's, I think it's a real risk. I understand what Alice is proposing to do, but I think our politics right now argue against anything like that happening. And I think, and I sort of conclude, sorry for going on, is, is that the best way is not to begin with the necessity of a bipartisan agreement, but just the opposite, to, to say, no, uh, we're going to lay out what we think makes sense. If the public doesn't rein in the insurgent outlier party and say, you know, that's, that's an economic agenda for a country that renegotiates 100 years of, of policy, we don't want it. Until we get to that point and different Republican leaders emerge, we're not going to have any bipartisan consensus. So what do we do in the meantime? Okay. So your prescription is a big Democratic win in November, retake all three uh, branches of government, and then everything's OK. Uh, <laughs> teach those Republicans Is that lesson. right? <laughs> uh, I know. We, we, we're not allowed to say that. Now, we're, we're nonpartisan, bipartisan, in the press and in the think tanks. and. 
even if we see a reality uh, that's unbalanced, we got to say it's balanced, and they say this, and they say this. We have to say Republicans care about as much about having universal health care coverage, they care as much uh, about uh, deficit reduction and deficits, uh, uh, and that their seeming emphasis on tax cuts aren't really that much of an obstacle. We can have tax reform and make, uh, make everyone happy. Yeah, I think it'd be better if that happened. Uh, uh, this time around, yeah, I believe in unified government. I think divided party government is horrible right now. It doesn't work with this degree of polarization. And uh, more, it's almost certain that won't happen. Um, but I don't think you improve the situation by going into the campaign you know, sort of anesthetizing the public and saying, oh, it's the whole system, they're both at fault, we just need to bring them, bring them together. It seems to me that demobilizes the public uh, and disarms them, and, and therefore it's better to talk straight, even if it's awkward. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me, let me do this. I, I, wanna, I hope I'm, you recognize that none of the things he, he just attributed to me no. were actually said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not attributing them to you <laughs> at all. All right. I want to I wanna give Alice a chance to, you know, to, to respond a little more in just a second. But I, I, wanted, I wanted to, and, and then I want to get Mark's um, take on the, on the lay of the land on, on all this, too. I just wanted to ask Tom one question. The, you know, it, I've been watching. You know, we've we've both been watching Congress for a long time, and they have actually gotten into this cycle where they just say, you know what, let's just take it to the voters. Um, you know, the second you know second year of every election cycle, that's what they do. Let's let the voters settle it, um, and then it kind of happens over and over and over. So, you know, is it is it realistic to think that um, that this can be a solution even in this kind of polarization? You know, even if we take your point that the parties are not equal and whatever, can we? Can we actually uh, count on, you know, a, de a you know a decisive uh, uh, statement one way or another from the voters? Do we know that they're paying attention to the issues enough that uh, that we can count on this to happen? Of course not. We can't count on that at all. And you're quite right in pointing out the normal dynamics and routines of American politics, which work is so far as you have sort of two parties somewhat in you know the mainstream of American politics with clearly articulated differences of values and philosophies but basically accepting the legitimacy of each other of believing in facts and evidence and science of of, of being willing to engage in real collaboration but if that if that doesn't happen, divided government is a disaster, and the voters ought to know that. And we ought to tell them and talk straight to them, and not and not mesmerize them into thinking where it's you know a bipartisan agreement is around the corner. Uh, I think it's not. And just in terms of pure hardball politics, uh, uh, if Obama is reelected, even with the Republican Congress, he has one advantage, which is. The status quo is unacceptable to the Republicans uh, with all those tax cuts. Mind you, it's unacceptable to Obama, too, because of the immediate macroeconomic hit. But, but both, of, you know, both now have some leverage, not just, uh, not just uh, an opposition party willing to use the filibuster to, to kill or discredit or, or nullify every element uh, that the majority was able to put in the... Uh, uh, practice. Okay, Alice, I'd like to <coughs> give you a little more time. It sounds like there's a lot to there's a lot to dig into there. Well, I, no, I don't want to take much time. I think uh, my position is clear. I think on the question of the rising debt, uh, we do need a bipartisan agreement. Maybe consensus is the wrong word. Maybe deal is the right word. Uh, but uh, we, uh, gridlock is actually not an acceptable answer when your debt is rising faster than your economy can grow. Um, it's not an acceptable answer to climate change, for example, either. Uh, there are a lot of costs to gridlock, but the one that might have the most immediate uh, consequences is uh, not putting in place a long-run plan uh, to curb the growth of debt. And I think that has to include 
taxes and entitlements and therefore has to include both parties. Uh, I, I don't need to belabor that. Uh, unless we have that deal, I don't think we, uh, we get there. Now, on the uh, question of uh, controlling health care costs, there are lots of options. Uh, one is to do what is in the Affordable Care Act, which I support, uh, which is uh, to look for all the possible ways that we can deliver health care more effectively and more efficiently. And, and these are built into uh, the Affordable Care Act. And then by regulation, use Medicare as the leader in getting those into place. Another way uh, is uh, to uh, have organized competition on an exchange among capitated health plans, health plans that agree to take care of you for, for a year, and they have to take care of anybody who comes, uh, and let them compete. Now, we already do this in Medicare Advantage. We don't have a very good structure for the competition. And uh, all the proposal that uh, uh, Pete Domenici and I put together is organize a, an exchange that will improve the competition but make it an option, it's, it's an option now, uh, for uh, keep uh, regular Medicare as the default option, everybody's in it unless they don't want to be, uh, and uh, provide this other option. Uh, I don't believe that's a pernicious or risky thing uh, to do. It's saying there are two ways to go, we don't know which will work, let's do both. Okay, um, so, let, so let's do this. In where Ross has been seeing her an awful long, long time, and I want to get to you in a second because Ross's paper uh, looks at the obesity challenge. I want to give that a good focused discussion that, that it, it deserves in its own right. But I do want to ask Mark, um, who has been kind of watching this, this landscape for, for a long time too, what do you think is realistic on the Affordable Care Act where we've seen the public get, you know, com, you know sort of completely dug into their positions and, you know, there's doesn't seem like there's a lot of minds to be changed anymore on that. And what do we do to get that, get that Medicare deal um, uh, after, you know, when, when is it possible to do that given the way that discussion has been going lately? Uh, sure, David. It's, it's been interesting to watch the landscape generally and also the landscape uh, on this panel <laughs> for the last uh, uh, half hour as well. So maybe we can provide a, a little bit of a, a different perspective. And I do want to get to what will or, or what may or may not happen with the ACA. It does depend because of the very strong differences in views across the parties about the ACA. It does depend a lot on what happens in the election, who wins the presidency, who wins control of the House and, uh, and Senate. Uh, and there are going to be very different outcomes. But I don't think that takes away from the fact that um, despite the, the strong partisan and deep philosophical divides on the big issues related to the ACA right now, that both parties uh, uh, are going to have to work together in some important ways in, in working through some of the urgent problems related to our health care system. In that regard, there are, there are a lot of Republicans, uh, Tom, who do care about better care and lower costs and uh, are uh, trying to think hard about, uh, about all of this and how to get there. And it, the, the action may not come from uh, sort of a coming together philosophically about the, the future for our country, but more about, uh, as Alice was saying, the necessity to make a deal. Um, that's actually happening, uh, believe it or not, on some health care issues right now. There, I will predict right now there will be uh, bipartisan legislation on user fees for prescription drug uh, innovation, for medical devices, for all kinds of other activities that the FDA regulates, because that's must-pass legislation to keep the FDA in business. And that's actually a really important piece of healthcare legislation because those drugs, those biologics, those medical devices are the future in terms of finding ways to uh, deliver better care and better outcomes and maybe save money by preventing complications too. There will be bipartisan legislation on that because it has to happen. There will be bipartisan legislation of some form by early next year on physician payment reform in Medicare. We're in a situation now that we keep getting into year after year where the status quo of trying to save money by squeezing down prices more on, on doctors and Medicare isn't something that we can really follow through on. We've uh, taken that string about as far as we can, and there, is a, there are a lot of discussions going on right now between members on a bipartisan basis as well as their staffs on how to get out of that cycle. That doesn't mean it won't be easy to do, but there is some genuine engagement around payment reform 
in Medicare, building on a lot of steps that Medicare is taking now, took when I was there, uh, to move away from, you know, I don't think you can really call it fee-for-service Medicare anymore, maybe traditional Medicare, right. but right. it's moving away from uh, paying for volume and intensity and, and trying to move towards paying for better care and lower costs in a lot of cases, trying to emulate what's going on in the private sector or, or state or regional-based reforms too. So, so there, what these have in common is, is, is must pass and must find a way forward. Now, so that brings me to the ACA in the election, and it will be a different outcome depending on who wins. This election does matter for the, the future of the ACA, uh, regardless, I think, of what the Supreme Court does. I mean, that's an important decision, but uh, it's not going to be as dispositive as some of these other factors that I, I'm going to talk about right now. Um, if the Republicans do sweep uh, Republican presidency, President Romney, and uh, um, Republican control of the House and the Senate, most of the ACA is likely to go the same way it came, via reconciliation, where with uh, 50 votes plus one in the Senate, a majority in the House signed by the President, any major provision that has significant direct federal budgetary implement, uh, implications can be removed. So what would be included there? Well, the individual mandate, again, regardless of what the Supreme Court does about it, that has significant budgetary costs, according to the Congressional Budget Office. I think mean, uh, it sounds like this is consistent with kind of Alice's view, is that, um, yes, having the mandate there does get more people in the pool, but if you don't have it, um, the, it's not that um, insurance markets won't exist at all. Premiums may be a bit higher, depending on how well you deal with adverse selection. Um, uh, but uh, fewer people participating means fewer number of subsidies given out by the government means lower overall budgetary costs. So that provision can go. Uh, the subsidies for the exchanges um, would be uh, significantly revised if not removed. On the other hand, pre uh, uh, President Romney, uh, Governor Romney, uh, uh, President Romney in the scenario has said that he favors giving individuals uh, uh, something like a credit, an uh, amount of money that they could spend of their own choice to buy health insurance coverage, which uh, might be a different form and in a different context than uh, in the current ACA, but let's you know, move in that uh, direction too. Um, in uh, uh, the, uh, another key provision is the Medicaid expansions, and that's something that um, states have said that uh, they can't afford right now, so you could see that uh, rolled back, and as uh, Tom said, uh, more of a push in the direction of um, block grants, uh, overall amounts of money that are more controlled by the state, uh, with the flip side that if the state finds a way to save money in Medicare and, and do what's uh, necessary for coverage, then it gets to share in more of the savings. Right now, a lot of that doesn't go to the states, and so that's uh, something that many Republicans view as leading to higher costs and more inefficiencies. I would say here, too, that even if the Republicans don't win, uh, if you look at what's going on in Medicaid, both in terms of coverage through Medicaid managed care plans that are comprehensive and that ca get capitated payments on a per person basis, uh, and for dual eligible Medicare beneficiaries who traditionally were part of a very fragmented Medicare and Medicaid fee for service system and have not been getting good care, as Melanie Bella and CMS uh, uh, I think said very eloquently, uh, eloquently recently, um, that program too is moving towards more integration and what may be more of a capitation focus, more of this notion of shared savings. So it may not get all the way to uh, uh, what, you know, sort of an extreme version that some have painted of, of you know, just, uh, 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 just uh, um, uh, you know, fixed amount of money, just, uh, um, uh, just uh, one Medicaid payment, but um, moving in the direction of some accountability for uh, covering people, delivering good care, but more flexibility in how to get there and more opportunities for states to save along the way. Uh, that seems like where Medicaid is headed uh, regardless of who wins, and maybe there'll be some differences of degrees uh, in getting there. So in, in all of those respects, it, yes, there would be a, a big difference from uh, you know, a, a repeal of key provisions of the ACA, but um, I think we're headed in those directions to some extent anyway. I mean, one more example of this is the, uh, is the individual mandate if President Obama is reelected, re and let's say as well, which seems iffy right now, that the Supreme Court upholds the mandate. Um, even in that case, I think it's going to be very difficult to implement. I mean, it's not that strong of a mandate to begin with. It's phased in over a couple of years with just a, a small penalty in the first year. And if we aren't sort of fully up to speed and ready to roll in every state on time 
next fall, fall of 2013, is when you know, people would need to make their decisions about enrollment. Uh, if there's some confusion about uh, who's eligible for what subsidy, if there's some uh, confusion about what plans will be available, if the, the cost of some of the plans aren't uh, quite as uh, low as some people had hoped for, uh, one could easily see Congress on, uh, maybe with uh, President Obama's support, support pushing back uh, that deadline for uh, an individual mandate penalty, not necessarily you know, not going ahead with the whole law, but it does mean that Congress is going to be revisiting these issues. It's going to, it's, it's, again, gets into this must-pass uh, category of legislation, and it brings me to an area where I think there is potential for a lot of bipartisan interest, and that is in how do you make competitive health insurance plans work without a mandate. Uh, so that's where the Republicans are very clearly want to go. I think for the reasons I just described, that's where the, the Democrats, even if they stay in control, are de facto going to have to think about going. That's where we're going to go if the Supreme Court tells us to go there. And there are some good models for at least starting to work through those problems. Uh, one of them actually comes in something kind of like premium support that's are already in Medicare, and that's the Medicare Part D program, which is a bunch of competing private plans without a mandate, with subsidies from the government that seniors choose between for their drug coverage. And drug coverage, I can tell you when this program was started in 2006, was viewed as a part of health care coverage that would not work as a standalone insurance benefit. It was too predictable. But between subsidies, risk adjustment, uh, other steps like uh, uh, reinsurance uh, to protect uh, high-cost beneficiaries and to encourage plans uh, to, to design uh, uh, benefits to attract those beneficiaries, steps like limited open enrollment periods, late enrollment penalties, it's actually working pretty well and I think kind of got the ultimate compliment in the ACA, which was you know, not to be repealed or overturned, as people are talking about with the ACA, but to be built upon and expanded. Um, so you know, th there are some reasons to think that whoever wins, they're going to have to find some ways to, to work together. And that brings me to the last point I wanted to make, kind of going beyond the ACA on the, in this kind of this must-pass legislation. And I think Alice articulated this uh, really well, which is the, the overall uh, very frightening deficit and, and fiscal outlook for the long term. Um, Congress did deal with that in a limited way last summer when they had to, when they were facing the, the, the debt limit uh, uh, vote and, and expansion. They came close, uh, somewhat close at least, to uh, uh, potentially a bigger deal. There's a foundation to build on there, and, and frankly, I think some of the best opportunities for, for Medicare reform, entitlement reform, maybe uh, next steps with uh, Medicaid and with uh, coverage more generally may come in the context of a, a broader tax reform debate uh, that would get into some of these issues, like broadening the base, as Paul Ryan uh, has proposed, it may be difficult to come together, but I think we're going to have that discussion early next year between the fiscal cliff and the uh, uh, expiration of all of the, the tax uh, cut provisions from the Bush era. Um, that together means that both sides really have incentives to, to try to get together and do something uh, on these problems, and uh, it should be interesting to see what that turns out to be. Definitely. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about Ross's paper now, which is which is about uh, the the obesity problem and and how significant a, a driver of of healthcare costs it really is. Far more significant than I think most people realize, um, and how important it will be for the next president to uh, to tackle that if they really want to get healthcare costs down. But then it begs the question: what you, what do you do about it? What can you do about it? How can you how can you um, how can you actually head it off before it happens? Well, sure. well thank you. And I've been following this conversation uh, very <laughs> intently. It's very interesting. And I agree, certainly, that uh, taxes and deficits are important and that who's covered by insurance is important. But fundamentally, what uh, a, a major driver of health care costs is who gets sick, or what they get sick with, and uh, what outcomes they experience. That's, that's really fundamental. And I think from that perspective, that perhaps the largest threat facing this country on health care really is the obesity epidemic. And let me tell you why I think that. It's now the case that two-thirds of all American adults and one-third of all American children are overweight. So the majority of adults and a large percentage of children are overweight. And being overweight or obese puts you at much, much higher risk for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, for several kinds of cancer, for asthma, for arthritis, for a long list of other conditions, many of which are chronic conditions. They're things that require treatment over a long period of time through your life course. And that leads to very much higher 
costs, medical costs, associated with treatment of long-term chronic conditions. By many estimates, uh, medical spending in the overweight and the obese is as much as 100% higher than that of people who are healthy weight. And uh, I think the best recent estimate I've seen is that at least 21% of all US healthcare spending is driven by the obesity epidemic, 21%. And that's a number that's increased substantially just in the last decade and it could easily increase in the, in the decades to come if we don't do a better job of controlling this epidemic. There's also the issue that chronic diseases are occurring earlier and earlier in children now. We're having type 2 diabetes, which used to be called adult onset diabetes, cropping up in, in teenagers and even younger children. Uh, and there's a new estimate out on the street that one in every three children born in the US today will develop diabetes in their lifetime. And one in every two Latino or African American children will develop diabetes in their lifetime. Let me say that again, one in every two children born today that's a huge number of people who will have diabetes. That's gonna be a major driver of healthcare costs no matter who's insured or not insured. That's gonna be something that we have to do uh, something about as a country. And there's new evidence that children who are born today may in fact have a shorter life expectancy than their parents for the first time in many, many, many years in this country. So what does this all mean uh, on the cost side? It means that prevention is gonna be extremely important. Obesity in particular is something for which prevention is critical because obesity is very hard to treat once it's entrenched. There are physiological reasons for that and behavioral reasons for that. And we have to catch it early. And the antecedents of obesity actually uh, start in childhood. So that's the, that's the right place to focus. Uh, prevention can also lead to huge cost savings. Uh, by one estimate, uh, just a 5% decrease in the amount of diabetes in this country would save $25 billion a year, every year. If it was a 10% decrease, an even bigger number. So prevention can have real action on the healthcare cost side. Uh, and as you alluded to earlier, prevention is not easy necessarily, uh, but it does have uh, some advantages in the sense that a lot of the most effective prevention strategies bypass gridlock at the federal level of policy and are about what happens at the community level and the individual level and the state level. And there's a lot more that can be done there that avoids some of the pitfalls of bipartisan gridlock uh, that's on a much smaller scale, but that ultimately makes, a, I would argue, an even bigger difference in the ultimate healthcare cost outcomes that this country faces, as well as our overall competitiveness internationally by having a healthy and productive workforce. Well, let me ask you about that. So how do you, how do you tackle this? I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's public education campaigns, sure. but you know, how do you get people to listen? Mm -hmm. And then you also talk a little bit in your paper about uh, sort of integrating approaches across a variety of policy areas that you don't think of just in healthcare, education, housing, so, and some others. Um, maybe you talk a little bit about that because it's a little hard to picture how all of these things would sure. come together. Well, so, the, so fundamentally, the drivers of things like obesity are very simple. Obesity is about energy imbalance. Energy in, energy out. More energy comes in and goes out, you gain weight. That's what an obesity is about. But unfortunately, the drivers of energy in, of what you eat, are actually very complex. There's a lot of complex biology, and we live in a very complex environment, a social environment, a physical environment, an advertising environment, markets that, that our forces are at work. And so trying to understand how all these things fit together has been challenging for scientists because these are, the, these are different fields of science that aren't used to talking to each other. Geneticists and economists don't usually sit around discussing issues like obesity, but they need to, uh, and they have started to increasingly. But it also means that our policies have to be quite coordinated across many different sectors that play a role in the obesity epidemic. We know a lot of things that work in isolation, but the trick will be doing them all at the same time and in a coordinated way. And a lot of my work over the last couple of years with NIH and the CDC and the Institute of Medicine has been about finding these tools that will allow us to, to anticipate how all these different pieces of the puzzle fit together and to coordinate our policy efforts across many different sectors and many different levels, the local level, the community level, the federal level, to try to actually have a cohesive, holistic, systemic approach to this problem because I think that's what it's going to take to make more progress. And how much can a president do about this? Because, you know, you kind of think, well, there's bully pulpit and then there's, you know, pass legislation, but good luck with that. We're gridlocked, yeah. right? You know, what's realistic? Well, there are, there are what's bunch of things that I think a president can do in particular that I lay out in my paper. And I think one of those things uh, that's, that's absolutely fundamental is to invest in biomedical research and public health research because this is a very, very hard problem. It's one that's not going away. It's one that's increasingly a worldwide problem and we need to understand it better and we need to understand what to do about it better very urgently. And so cutting 
NIH funding is not the way to go about understanding it better. Increasing it would be. So that's, that's a fundamental thing a president can do. Another thing a president can do is to help raise awareness about this issue. The president has an awfully large bully pulpit. Uh, the first lady, the current first lady, has done a lot to raise awareness on these issues. I think a president should continue to put both the idea that prevention is important and that obesity is important forward. And third, I think there's, there's a lot of barriers uh, in place to prevent coordination of policy at every level, including the federal level, between, say, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services. But that's the kind of coordination that we're really going to need, and that's something that the executive branch can help to facilitate. Okay. All right. So um, I think we'd like to, to start uh, opening up to questions from the audience. And um, when you when you speak, we're um, we're going to be going to be bringing a mic around in a second. When you speak, uh, we'd just like you to, you know, uh, speak directly into the microphone so we can get good, clear uh, sound recording, and uh, uh, everybody can uh, uh, get a good view of this, um, sir. Uh, hello, <clears throat> I'd like to ask the panelists whether their plans would include any role for public health clinics in the community. I raise this because uh, I have friends and relatives working in the healthcare field, and they tell me that the emergency rooms of hospitals are full, full of people who would benefit from community health care being provided free and quickly uh, and in a friendly manner until the problem becomes uh, ripe for emergency care in the hospital? Um, sure. The uh, community-based interventions are really the, the future of health care. Uh, the, the overall trends, as, as Ross described, are uh, in costs are going to be determined by things like chronic diseases that relate to obesity and um, uh, other chronic diseases that uh, um, can be prevented through early uh, preventive interventions. Um, there are a number of steps underway now that I think both parties uh, uh, support in different forms to try to encourage more uh, prevention-oriented care. So in Medicare, for example, uh, right now um, the Medicare program is implementing medical home uh, initiatives and accountable care organization initiatives that, that try to put the focus on improving the health of the individual, not just providing more services, more you know, treating more complications after they happen. So I think those those steps are also being implemented in the private sector, implemented by employers with, an, with the goal of moving towards community-based care. It's still the case today that most of our institutions and most of our financing is kind of tied up the traditional way in dealing with these problems uh, after they happen. Uh, but I think there are some constructive steps in the right direction. This is especially a problem for lower income and vulnerable populations who often have the, the worst access to health care because of low prices or because of in, in Medicaid or because of not being covered. And, um, and when cutbacks make uh, this kind of community care less available. Um, here too, though, I think there's some good alternative models. That, um, uh, here at Brookings and the Engelberg Center, we've been working with uh, several of those. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, in Camden, New Jersey, and now in other parts of New Jersey, a uh, primary care physician named Jeff Brenner has started a new model for community-based care delivery for largely uninsured patients who were showing up um, uh, not to get preventive care, but were showing up in the emergency room with very costly complications related to um, chronic diseases, mental health uh, issues on top of it, and we're not getting any of this kind of community-based coordinated care. Uh, they've invested not just in more primary care services, but also in more um, uh, like nurse practitioners, social workers in the neighborhoods, you know, not even in, not even community-based clinics, but just in the, the neighborhoods and housing uh, where people are getting care. That's being financed by redirecting the money that was going into emergency care into uh, providing coordinated support at the community level for these interventions. That requires some real changes. They've had to go through a lot of hoops in terms of everything from antitrust laws to uh, um, getting bipartisan Medicaid legislation uh, to support these coordinated uh, efforts, these accountable care efforts in, in New Jersey. It's not easy, but it is happening. Another good example is in uh, Denver, where uh, uh, a, uh, a public uh, entity called Denver Health provides services for low-income and uninsured people in the community, and they've been able to do that and sustain it and actually be a leader in um, uh, quality improvement and applying 
uh, manufacturing processes like Toyota Lean Production to healthcare, you know, leader for our whole healthcare system, by redirecting how they how the the money flows. So instead of again going to uh, treating complications after it happens, they have capitated payments in many cases. They get uh, overall uh, budgets from the city and from other sources that they are accountable for in terms of getting better population health results. So these should be key parts of healthcare reform. There are some good examples of this happening around the country, and hopefully we will see more of it. I think these are things that, again, both parties can find ways to support. But it's just, not in the current uh, legislation. It's not, it, it, there's certainly much more needs to be done compared to what's in current legislation. <laughs> Well, let me, just, let me just add to that. I, I agree with Mark entirely that the community level is absolutely fundamental to solving a lot of these issues. And I think it actually goes beyond clinics as, as one form of community intervention. I think a lot of what happens in communities, whether it's social support, whether it's the, environment, the physical environment, opportunities for physical activity, opportunities to access healthy food, and social norms are really fundamental to health outcomes. And there's a lot that can be done at the community level going well beyond the actual healthcare arena. Hi, Mike Miller. I'm a physician and health policy consultant analyst, uh, wannabe wonk. Um, I want to sort of tie together a couple of things, what Ross said about obesity and then sort of some of the other things about the healthcare deficit projections and things. Because it's something I, in a meeting a while ago, talked to somebody about that you know, the projections are our best estimates, our best guesses. They're not fait accompli. And one of the things Ross brought up about obesity, um, I just read recently something about how trans fat uh, blood levels in Americans have dropped dramatically in the last few years. And I got to attribute that to the labeling and the awareness of people. And I'm sure five, seven years ago when the FDA regulations were requiring trans fat labeling that led to food companies marketing, you know, no trans fats, everything else, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that CBO didn't score that as a cost saving or effective estimated any effects it's going to have on obesity. So I mean, what? Are, and there's other f nutritional food factors, and you know, Ross talked about the energy balance is what causes obesity. You know, it's what we put in our pie hole versus everything else that happens to us that determines whether we become obese as a country or as individuals. Can you guys talk a little bit more about? you know, factors, whether it's food and changes in the farm bill, which may or may not be a bipartisan deal, or uh, it's sort of stuck right now, as I understand, or some of the healthcare things that may go along, that may not get adequately, may not be scorable, but may have a significant impact on our healthcare, uh, our healthcare spending, our healthcare financial, financial situation, whether it's for Medicare or in the private sector. Thank you. From my perspective, certainly uh, what happens in agriculture, what happens in housing, what happens in education, and what happens uh, in healthcare are all very closely related. And it's, it's pretty hard to think about what will happen to healthcare and obesity in particular in this country in the future without thinking about tax policy, food policy, uh, agricultural policy, transportation policy, because these are fundamental drivers. But a lot of it comes back to the community. Sure. And we haven't talked much about exercise, but that's got to be a very big uh, component. Yeah. And schools have been cutting back on exercise uh, programs uh, and uh, exercise facilities, and that needs to be reversed. Uh, they need to do more. It doesn't have to be fancy. They just got to get the kids moving around. Absolutely. David, could I just could I yes, just sir. say a word? Um, I mean, I'm struck by the incredibly constructive uh, initiatives underway within, uh, within Medicare, within Medicaid. That, I mean, we're seeing a transformation in many respects mm -hmm. in the nature of these programs in an effort to, <coughs> to grapple with them and the growing realization that some forms of community clinics, facilities, different kinds of treatment of care instead of reimbursing cost of, for expenditures. I mean, all of this is, is immensely encouraging. And I think if you could get politicians together out of, uh, out of public sight uh, uh, to talk about these and deal with them, you could. There, I talked to a lot of Republicans, and it's, <laughs> it's true. Most of them are former. If we could get Alan Simpson and Pete Domenici sort of back 
<laughs> you know, now it'd be, a, it'd, it'd be a lot easier. But the problem is the debate occurring nationally is utterly divorced from all of the constructive things occurring underneath. And sadly, sometimes it's that debate that's, that's cutting budgets for the very kind of initiatives uh, that both of you are talking about where government is seen as a problem and therefore it certainly can't, and that's happening in states as well as uh, in the federal government where public employees are being demonized and, and uh, government uh, must be squeezed and limited to, uh, in, in ways that could sort of really kill many of uh, these initiatives. Uh, uh, before they get uh, get up to scale, and and so I do think that broader debate is is important, and it's 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 why why I emphasize what I did, not to deny at all yeah. the kind of innovative uh, uh, work going on behind the uh, scenes. Yeah, just a, can I just say one more thing on this too? Is I think it's a very important topic. It, it, it does seem like the healthcare debate for the fall election has reached its very high level fundamental philosophical disagreement. I mean, in some ways, it's not even really about health care anymore. It's really about what the role of federal government is or should be in American life. And um, that's just an issue that, that Americans right now do seem to really differ on, at least as reflected in um, some of the supporters of Republicans versus Democrats uh, on these issues. Um, I think to, to put together what Tom said with what I was trying to emphasize with all these things that are going on in many cases uh, are not happening at the federal level but are happening in states both Republican and Democratic states and in uh, local governments on places like uh, like Colorado is that these are must address issues so uh, we are going to continue to have this philosophical debate about the role of federal government I think for a while I, you know your views may differ but I don't think that's going to be settled in the uh, in the November election I think that's still going to be with us um, I think the uh, the important thing beyond that is that uh, there are some models and examples of being able to address these very serious issues in healthcare and in our nation's fiscal outlook more generally. We may be doing it because we're up against the wall of must-pass legislation. We may be doing it for reasons uh, uh, other than you know just happy talk getting together. But uh, I think it is going to continue to happen because these fundamental issues must be addressed. We cannot afford the kinds of obesity trends that uh, we were just hearing about. We cannot afford to keep doing what we've been doing in Medicare and Medicaid. It's going to change. I'm Dr. Susan Blumenthal. I served as Assistant Surgeon General, and now I'm Director of Health and Medicine at the Center for the Study of the Presidency. I just want to kind of uh, echo some of the points that were being made here. Um, public health has been a major uh, driver of increased life expectancy. We've almost doubled uh, life expectancy in one century. We have safe food, safe water, um, and access to health care in, in greater numbers now as a result of investments in, in government-sponsored programs. Uh, however, we, we spend only 3 to 5 percent of our $2.6 trillion health care budget on prevention and public health. The ACA included in it a prevention and public, health, healthness, uh, public wellness fund, uh, which is now going to be plucked uh, under current proposals to pay for food stamps, for example. It's low-hanging fruit. And the idea was to do what you were saying, is to create health and all policy solutions that we need at the table, which the White House has done, created a task force on obesity that cross cuts all of the major departments of government uh, because no health can no longer be in the province of the health department. It has to involve all of the agencies of government with working with the private sector because for those of us trained in medicine, we can't change obesity one person at a time. We have to do it with systemic public health, uh, community-based um, interventions. But if we're going to put health into the health system and not have it be a sick care system, then we need these kinds of innovations like the prevention fund, which um, you know, is, is being targeted for extinction. We, 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 can't, we can't do it just by talking about it. We need the support, the innovation, and the cross-cutting approaches that were described. Yeah, I would like to throw that out to the panel because you're right, that is the backdrop of, of all this that, that we're talking about. You know, the Prevention and Public Health Fund is now being targeted as, as a slush fund. It's, it was used as the... Already G been rated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, you know, how do you, you know, how do you, or is it possible to, 
change that debate with the fund the way it exists now? Uh, you know, does it have to be? You know, does it have to be uh, changed in in some in some major way if it doesn't if it doesn't get cut, cut out first? You know, how do we how do we kind of get beyond this sort of you know the, the the tone of the discussion that we're having now to talk about yeah. what's and beneath it? And it was a fifteen billion dollar fund, so I mean, it's you know that was a significant amount of investment in prevention, mm -hmm. which is being eradicated. Yeah. Good point. No, I just, uh, I think um, any of these sort of standalone proposals, whether it's a prevention fund, whether it's an add-on for, you know, studying uh, um, uh, the, the healthcare workforce uh, uh, and so on, those are, those are pretty easy targets in an increasingly tight fiscal era. And I think that goes back to what much of the panel uh, agrees on, from what I can tell, which is that um, prevention and public health and community-based care need to not be an add-on in the form of a fund, but need to be much more integral to the um, way that we're financing uh, health care, the way that we're regulating health care itself. And you know, that's why I think that maybe the more promising steps for the long term are things like uh, building in um, the, uh, the goal of keeping patients healthy into our payment systems in Medicare and into our benefit designs that employers are offering uh, and, uh, and steps like that, that that really get are intended to get directly at public health in healthcare, as you were saying. Right. And I think, the again, the ACA had those elements in it. It had incentives for employers to start workplace programs. Um, it has a national strategy for prevention. The accountable care organizations are aimed at doing just that, but that's once people are sick. I mean, the idea is to have also prevention programs to stop, I mean, that's primary prevention is, as you know, is, is not getting sick in the, in the first place. So I agree, I mean, it has to be integrated into the system. I think for the first time, this bill was really trying to create a prevention transformation um, and, um, and with a number of different, and, and preventive services, you know, that it paid without cost sharing and without deductible. And already 82 million people have benefited from free preventive services. That's early detection, so that's secondary prevention. But I think there was a gamut, a spectrum of interventions that were included to kind of create this transformation from a sick care system to a health system. Uh, back there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. Um, my question is about a, serve, a uh, study that came out from the Commonwealth Fund yesterday. Commonwealth Fund is well established, respected in healthcare, um, healthcare reform. Uh, the, the, the basis of both the Republican plan and the Affordable Care Act is that uh, people ask for too many services because they're free at the point of delivery and we have to reduce overutilization. What the Commonwealth Fund did, what they said, looking at plans in Europe and Japan, uh, was that a big problem? Uh, the reason our what, the, the most important reason our health care costs so much more than it does in Europe is because the prices are much higher. And I was wondering from Ms. Rivlin and from Dr. McClellan if they're planning to integrate this into their thinking about health care reform. Well, do you want to? This 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 uh, study came out yesterday. I have not seen it, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the last point you made is clearly right. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, we have uh, eight, 17 now, almost 18 percent of our GDP going into health care uh, is that our health care is expensive, and one of the reasons for that is we use specialists a lot more and we pay them more. Uh, uh, compared to uh, to other countries. Now, I don't know exactly how you turn that around, uh, except by some of the things we were talking about earlier, uh, emphasizing primary care and prevention, uh, and uh, trying to uh, train people in uh, different uh, uh, different approaches to uh, use of the healthcare workforce. Uh, some of the things Mark was talking about. Yeah, I guess I'd, I agree with that and add to it that, um, you know, our, according to the study, the prices here are higher. I mean, that's not new news. Um, you know, I think most people in, in this audience and around the world know that for, say, brand name drugs, our, our prices are higher than uh, just about any other country. The same thing is true, by the way, for 
physician services, hospital services, you name it, uh, there's some questions about what exactly is being measured, like what happens during a hospital day here in the U.S. is, is a lot more intensive than what happens in a hospital day elsewhere, and some things that maybe really are differences in intensity, if not quality of care, get captured as price in some of these measurement comparisons. But you know, there's something real going on there. I think the, the, the bigger issue, to, to Alice's point, is can we get more uh, not only more meaningful prices, but more meaningful action to bring down the prices. Um, and that goes to things like, I think, what you were mentioning, third, you know, third party payment and care that's uh, free at the, the, the point of use. Um, you know, people don't care about the prices that much. And in most cases, people don't even know what they are uh, when they're getting care. And there are a lot of uh, initiatives underway now to create more meaningful transparency, not just to give people a, a bunch of price lists, but to give them the information that they really need to uh, make better decisions about their care. This has happened in prescription drugs where we have the highest brand name prices in the, in the world, but we also have the lowest generic prices in the world because of a really effective generic competition system. And uh, what really made those prices matter in terms of care was when people started getting drug benefits where they could save a lot of money themselves. It didn't just go to some third party insurers when they switched from a brand to a generic. So in Medicare today, close to 80% of all prescriptions are generic and that's had a huge impact on Medicare's drug costs compared to you know just five years ago when it was closer to 50% generic. That same thing is starting to happen in other aspects of healthcare where some uh, insurers like uh, uh, those that are working with Safeway in California are providing information on the, the total cost of elective procedures like colonoscopies and giving uh, employees uh, benefits where um, you know, the, the plan will pay, say, $1,000 based on what you know, sort of looks like a reasonable cost of the, the, the procedure uh, as it's being done around the area. And if employees want to go to a more expensive provider, they pay the difference. The converse of that is they can get a free colonoscopy if they, if they search around for uh, a good price and get good quality information. That's really hard to do for much of healthcare today, but I think it is changing. And my guess is that, uh, just as Safeway found in Northern California, um, once you start having prices that matter and information that's meaningful to consumers that they can actually use to save money while getting better health, you're going to see those prices change. That's what happened with the, the, the colonoscopy uh, prices, at least use uh, with Safeway's uh, case. Um, thanks. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I, I write the Mitchell Report. And I, um, I'm struck by a, a metaphor that seems to me that that is sort of backdrop to all the components of what we've been talking about today. And that's something I know that that uh, Dr. Hammond uh, spends a lot of his time on. And that's the notion of complex systems. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the, the three thoughts came to my mind. I want to throw them out and imagine that there's a question mark at the end of this. Um, because that's its intent. Uh, one is the notion that that, um, that medicine itself, according to a number of people like David Agus and, and others, is, is moving very much in the direction of, of complex systems practice um, from treatment orientation to preventative orientation and use of proteomics and things of that sort. Uh, and, and so what impact might that have on all of the things that we're talking about today. The second is the kinds of programs that people like Michael Dell have instituted, the Well at Dell program, that w w because the private sector uh, is is the place where the you know this is this is one of the places where the profit motive can be very helpful because they've got real profit incentives to do something about it and start with their own workforce and the notion that that might. Uh, I won't say metastasize, but you know, spread uh, elsewhere. And the third, um, and I, I, I uh, is is what role social media uh, can have in um, in the in the sort of more than the educational component, but including the educational component that that, f for example, that that can get at things like um, obesity. One, I'm imagining what would have been like how the, how the, the, the movement against cigarette smoking might have moved differently and much faster if 
social media had been around when that was first beginning to be tackled. So all of that said, uh, it's the notion that the complex systems are sort of the backdrop to all of this. They have everything to do with the practice of medicine, the increasing role of private sector in, in driving down the causes of this and the role that social media might play in it. Yeah. I, I agree with you entirely that complex systems are an appropriate backdrop for this and that is an area I spend a lot of my time thinking about it that my training is in. I think um, two things, I'll, I'll, and then I'll let my colleagues also respond. One of them is that you're absolutely right that social media is very transformative in this space. I'm engaged in several projects, both that use data from social media to understand the choices that people are making and how those are informed by their context better, and that use social media as a tool to reach people and to change minds and, and to educate in this space. So I think that's absolutely fundamental. And two, uh, the bad news about complex systems is that they're complex and hard to disentangle. But the good news is that if you do understand them, you can have a lot of change by moving only a little bit. So tipping is a phenomenon that's, that's a hallmark of complex systems. And that's something that I think is very possible in this space uh, for policymakers if they make the right choices. Okay, I think we have time for one more, and if we could. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Nadell, Georgetown University. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the, the medical system, but uh, I think no one has mentioned yet the, the role of providers. Um, and let me just give a little backdrop. Uh, yeah, I think all of us have been in dentist's office. You see Washingtonian Magazine. And the most striking thing to me about Washingtonian Magazine is the page after page of advertisements from plastic surgeons, which tells me that there are too many residency slots for plastic surgery if they have to, you know, if you have to advertise to, to that extent. And we also hear that there is an in, increasingly insufficient number of primary care physicians. And of course, you know, we all know that they are undercompensated by Medicare and by, by private insurance for the time they put in. Um, is there, uh, regardless of what's on the table now, this is really d directed at Tom, do you think there's a chance in hell that, that Congress uh, could, could get in the business uh, for a more f putting more force or, or some sort of um, almost rationing behind residency slots so that we get more of what we need and less of what's co costing us uh, the proverbial arm and leg? <laughs> He answered his own question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bruce, well, I mean, let's Mark uh, let Mark yeah. answer the qu this question. He knows uh, he knows enough to get it right. Well, I don't know about that, <laughs> but uh, I know enough to have an opinion. Um, so, uh, you know, rationing uh, of residency slots can only take you so far. Uh, we do have. Uh, there are slots are effectively rationed. You know, the, the federal government pays through Medicare and to some extent through Medicaid for uh, graduate medical education, and those slots are allocated by specialty. And oh yeah, there are a lot more subsidized in primary care than there are in plastics. Um, interesting, if you look the last few years, um, I think it's the very hardest um, slot residency slot to match in is in. Plastics. It's uh, up there with dermatology and much further down towards the bottom, but coming up uh, is, uh, is primary care. And I think that's not so much a function of the residency slot policy as it is a function of just the, the, the lifestyle and practice uh, associated with these different specialties. And, um, you know, I know we've talked a lot about the need for more, you know, kind of government intervention and so forth and uh, in supporting primary care, but, you know, Plastics does not get much coverage right now. It's, it's largely, uh, at least for cosmetic surgery, it's outside of what's covered by third-party insurance and, and Medicare. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the reason that you see a lot of those ads is, uh, is number one, there's a lot of competition that goes on, on uh, intended to be on quality and price. You know, unlike uh, most many aspects of care, when you get your plastic surgery, you get kind of an all-in price along with some uh, evidence of, you know, what uh, either from friends and the people who contribute to, to Washingtonian Magazine, they have ratings for, uh, for these guys, uh, or uh, more objective measures of um, uh, the quality of the procedure that you're getting. And, and you know, in some ways, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's moved in the direction that um, we'd like to see elsewhere in terms of price transparency and 
uh, and information on quality that's being uh, that's being presented to uh, to, to to patients. Um, it's much tougher in in primary care. The the payment rates have been lower uh, historically. That's hopefully changing with some of the reforms that that we described. And the role and the lifestyle for primary care doctors will hopefully improve as well. Um, one of the things that um, Blue Cross of Massachusetts has noted since implementing some of their ACO type reforms, which started with a kind of a big medical home additional payment to primary care doctors plus a lot more support and in terms of data on their patients and how they were getting care and backup from nurse practitioners and the like was that the quality of life of the primary care physicians involved improved as did their financing and so it's turning out to be a very popular program uh, in, in Massachusetts, and I think that's the way uh, to, to make primary care more popular, and uh, hopefully some of these reforms that we've talked about today, and I'd argue uh, both presidential candidates, one way or another, are going to have to find ways to, uh, to make progress on that. All right, and with that, I think we have reached the end of our time, but uh, we'd like to give a big thanks to all of our panels for taking the time to come here and mix it up, and uh, it's been a it's been a great discussion. Thanks to the Brookings Institution for putting this on, and uh, please try to join us for the next discussion in the Campaign 2012 series. And thanks a lot.